One, two, three. Oh. Phew. Okay. Right, I apologise for that. Um... Right, okay, let's crack on. Small technical hitch. I'd muted the microphone, that's all it was in the end. Um, so today we're looking at attention. First thing I have to do when I come in is to get your attention, otherwise learning will not take place. Very important thing. We're the only, we're the only species that takes interest in what others are interested in. It forms the basis of a lot, well, if not, well, mo most face-to-face -face teaching and learning. Um, unsurprisingly, therefore, it is of great interest to educators. We are particularly interested um, as educational psychologists in disorders that uh, are concerned with attention. <coughs> but what is attention? Well, we're going to have to, first of all, deal with this concept of working memory again, because working memory and attention are so closely bound up. We'll be looking at the supposed uh, system or systems that may be involved in how and when we allocate attention, uh, particular interest in anterior cingulate cortex and prefrontal cortex, and then we'll be looking at ADHD, really only scraping the surface because uh, so much literature on this but i did want to talk to you about dopamine deficit theory as it's something that can very well link together a lot of the apparently contradictory findings oh and teaching and learning notes we'll be having a little walk during the lecture yeah okay so working memory we've already talked about as a memory system although of course it's usually for a very short period of time. Working memory, if we're going to define it, if somebody wants to define working memory, if I pick somebody randomly, <gasps> eye contact disappears. <laughs> I do not wish to share your attention. Um, come on, folks. Uh, what supposing I asked uh, uh, Gregor, is it? Yes, Gregor. Uh, I don't know. Uh, short-term memory. Uh, short memory, that's an interesting one because some people think short-term memory and working memory are the same thing. Other people will argue about that, but certainly it's closely enough related for some people to think it's the same. Anybody want to add anything else to that? Yes. It's that's really interesting. I can understand why you think that. But actually, I, things enter my working memory sometimes when I don't want them to, and I, I've lost control. So things can enter your working memory without you being in control. But generally in education and in other areas, we, we are very interested in how you maintain control over working memory. Interesting that. Interesting. Any other contributions? It has a limited capacity. What is it though? Yes. 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 It is. You're getting there. Not necessarily, but it could do. <laughs> 
confidence. Sorry. <laughs> and it integrates. Um, it, what did you say at the beginning? Yes. Okay. So there could be different components, um, but but essentially it's just the information that you can hold in your conscious attention. Okay. So it's what you're what you're consciously able to attend to in terms of information, but then information could mean visual spatial. So actually, it, you know, it's so close to the idea of consciousness and what you're conscious of um, that these two things are, you know, are are think, thought of often as inseparable. So you had a question? Uh, no. uh, I think that I have heard that the walking memory has a storage of uh, five till nine elements, seven uh, plus or minus seven two. Minus two. Yes. Yeah. So that and that and that is apparently you know supportable in terms of experiments. Uh, uh, for, uh, for numbers, have seven numbers and uh, yeah. nine. <laughs> yeah. Although bearing in mind you may be doing other things at the same time as trying to remember the numbers, so. Um, and the, and the other thing is you can chunk sometimes information together and get over that problem. So if I said to you, remember the numbers um, 4, 5, and 1066, it would be okay for those of you who are aware of your English history because 1066 is the date when the, the French invaded, and we're never going to forget that. Uh, so we've chunked that together. So it's possible for us to remember more numbers if we chunk information together. Okay, but the, the real point is that it's about conscious attention. It's about the information you can hold in conscious attention. And we, we were discussing this idea that whenever you mention something like, oh, I went for a walk across the Clifton Suspension Bridge, information from different parts of the brain are brought in to this. Um, you can think about it in a way as a sort of a bucket for holding that information. But actually, how accurate is that idea of, of thinking about it purely in terms of a, a storage space where you, you put information. That's something we're going to question. It's, another way of putting it is transient representation of task-relevant information. Okay, but it, I don't know about whether it has to be task-relevant, actually. I'm, I'm not sure about that because I've just said that sometimes things enter my working memory when I don't want them to and they occupy my mind. I might be thinking, I might be daydreaming, for example, and it's not task relevant, but I'm beginning to think about what I might eat tonight, which is an issue, actually. Oh, well, there I go, you see. It was definitely in my working memory, but it wasn't really task relevant. So I suppose what I'm trying to do is to, is to pour, not scorn, but I'm trying to make you sceptical. It's, it's a very important idea that was developed, I think, in, in Bristol, actually. Um, Badly and Hitch model of working memory. This is a cognitive model, boxes and arrows. But how close is this idea to the way in which information in terms of working memory is stored in the brain? Uh, here, what we see, we've got a central executive, which is sort of in charge, and it's got two working areas, one of them for chronological information. So you could be thinking about your phone numbers by sort of internally reciting them to yourself. Another one is visual spatial sketch pad. So if you're trying to remember uh, where you put something in the room for when you come back a few minutes later, you might be thinking top left hand cupboard and you're visualizing it. Uh, and when you come back in, if you've managed to keep it in your visual working memory, then you'll know where to look for it. Of course, you might have stored it in your long term memory, in which case you can just remember it. But if not, you're keeping all that information temporarily in your visual spatial sketch pad, or at least that's what uh, the Badley and Hitch model tells us. Um, unfortunately, um, it, it doesn't correlate terribly well uh, with what we see in the brain. So if we ask people to um, hold information in their consciousness, which is uh, spatial, so you expect that to be in the visual spatial sketch pad, or information which you can't represent spatially, so you'd have to represent that phonologically, wouldn't you? You'd have to be thinking about it in a little bit of an internal dialogue. Uh, we, we find that when you plot the areas of the brain which correlate to those two types of information that have been identified as working memory tasks, and we give them different colors, we find in the top there's quite a mixture. I mean, look at that in the right cortex there. And of course, we're looking at dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We like dorsolateral prefrontal cortex when it comes to working memory. This has been associated a lot with working memory function. But look at the distribution of it, um, especially in the right uh, hemisphere, 
we are seeing a mixture of blues and reds. So it's not like it's very clearly spatially differentiated in terms of the regions of the brain, the spatial sketch pad um, and the phonological loop, if, if you like. On the other hand, um, if we look at what you're doing with your working memory, whether you are just maintaining it or whether you're processing it in some way, uh, and then we plot that in terms of the brain regions that activate, we can see there's a little bit better separation. We're beginning to see that the, the red dots are becoming a little bit more dorsal um, and the, sorry, the red dots are becoming a bit more ventral and the, the, the blue dots representing the maintenance only are becoming a little bit more dorsal uh, up here. So brain imaging begins to, to make us question uh, some of these box and arrow models. And in fact, whether we should be representing information and processes in a, in a different way psychologically. My feeling is that ultimately the only psychology and neuroscience which is going to be left standing is going to be the stuff that actually aligns with each other. If the cognitive psychology is saying one thing and the neuroscience is saying something else, eventually one or other of those parties and possibly both are, are going to have to change their minds. Because, you know, if you're storing information in one way in the brain, it's going to have some implications in terms of cognition. Um, so, you know, some people say, oh, neuroscience, you know, we don't really need that in psychology. But actually, that's not what's happening. What's happening is that we are seeing more and more dialogue between these areas. And we are seeing psychological models that don't really align with the neuroscience being questioned and being changed. And when people have new ideas in cognitive psychology, they are bearing in mind what the neuroscience is telling us about them. And so I think as the years go on, so um, it's not that psychology is ever going to not exist, far from it. And it, in fact, the, we're going to see it become stronger as a result of the, the information coming from the neuroscience and vice versa. We need them both to be aligned with each other. Otherwise, eventually one of them has to change. Oh. Blimey, it's the wrong computer. Okay, so um, the big question though, or a big question, is how is the task relevant information selected, or even the task irrelevant information, how is it selected to go into your working memory? And you know, one, one part of the brain which appears to be quite important for that is the anterior cingulate, which you can see when you take a sagittal slice, you can see it on the inside in the medial wall of the brain at the front. Cingulate meaning island, so this is a part of the cortex that's exposed on the inside, but you can't see it unless you actually um, open up the brain and you look between the hemispheres. And there have been very various theories about this. I mean, one idea was that maybe the prefrontal cortex is a type of filtering system. Uh, maybe that is sort of only allowing certain amounts of information through. Um, and maybe the anterior cingulate is actually in charge of deciding which of the bits that come through the prefrontal cortex you are going to attend to. So the working memory requires some sort of um, attentional component in which goals modify the salience of different sources of information. Maybe the prefrontal cortex does that. Maybe the prefrontal cortex is taking in different sources of information and saying that is relevant to the goal, that is not relevant to the goal. And then the anterior cingulate is actually in charge of saying, well, then I'm going to orientate my attention towards this, this part which is relevant to my goal, is relevant to the task. Now, you know, you, you're already listening to me talking as if there is some homunculus in the brain. And the, the homunculus was this old medieval idea that there was a little person inside your brain who was actually in charge of things. Now, the idea of that has shifted, but the problem has not. We are still arguing about who is in charge in the brain. It's a problem because, you know, we're not even sure that anybody is actually because we're not sure if we believe in free will. So from a neuroscience point of view, this is a very difficult problem. But it's very important um, because one of the things you need to be able to do is to swap between different types of processing. One way of measuring how good you are at doing that is the good old Stroop task. 
Now, according to the Stroop task, reading what's on top should be slightly faster than reading what's on the bottom here. Because in the top, the colors and the meaning of the words are congruent. They are aligned with each other. Underneath, they're incongruent. And your mind is having to swap between two different sources of information. One part is automatically reading, saying it's blue. One part is automatically looking at the color and seeing red. And if I'm asking you what color the words are, it's very difficult for you to switch off from the fact that it spells blue and say it's red, uh, green, uh, blue. But to do that, you need to have a strong executive function, which is actually allocating attention and keeping your attention there and stopping it from switching. And different tasks, if you're told to go from task one to two, three, four, and you're going back between tasks, those activate different types of attentional systems. We know that. So you have a visual attentional system. You have um, an auditory attentional system. There has to be somebody in charge of all those that swaps between, not somebody, but some process in charge of those that swaps between those different attentional systems. And one possible home for that set of processes might be the anterior cingulate. So in psychology, it's been called the supervisory attentional system, the thing that allocates attention appropriately. And the home of that supervisory attentional system may be the anterior cingulate cortex. And that would explain why the anterior cingulate cortex activates whenever you, see, whenever you have to do something difficult, because you have to pay attention more. If it's novel, uh, because it's saying, oh, we haven't seen that before, let's have a look at it. Uh, if there is an error, because you need to be able to detect that error very quickly to correct it, um, and if you're overcoming something which, which is habitual, like, like reading in the Stroop task, so it's habitual to read the, the word and say blue, but actually you're supposed to be saying red because it's written in red. And another way of, or one way of trying to sort this out and deciding, you know, who is in charge? Is it the prefrontal cortex or is it the anterior cingulate that's actually making the decision about where you allocate attention? Would be to see which activates first in the task. Because whichever part of the brain activates first when you need to allocate attention, that is probably the home of the supervisory attentional system. Uh, so, for example, uh, Cohen, um, sorry, no, Snyder et al. Uh, in 95 looked at evoked response potentials. Now, those are EEG signals, changes in electrical activity above the brain, specific to uh, a, 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 a particular type of response. And using that approach, they asked uh, participants to either just repeat the word or or come up with a word that was associated with the word that they saw or heard. Um, and in the generation condition, you have to do uh, some additional work. You have to um, pay attention more to the, to, the, uh, to the task. It becomes a little bit more difficult. And they measured using ERPs because ele this electrical activity has got very good temporal resolution. So you can see which parts of the brain activate when and when they activate. So look at this. This is milliseconds here. And we can see that the part in brown there, which is the singular, activated first. And there is a slight sort of 400 millisecond delay before the other regions of the brain, prefrontal cortex, temporal cortex, come in. And that's probably the information being withdrawn from those areas in order to produce the task. Uh, well, with the prefrontal cortex, that's not, sorry, the temporal cortex is probably the information coming forward. Uh, what do I, what word do, can I think of that goes with chair? Uh, oh, yeah, sit. So maybe you're, you know, actually bringing forward some, some memory. But the prefrontal cortex, that's probably the information entering uh, the working memory or the working memory beginning to activate. That's the idea. So that seems to be evidence that the anterior cingulate is... Um, 
the home of the supervisory attentional system, that very important part that allocates attention in the first place. But actually, this argument is, is, is going on. Um, and if you look at this paper and all the papers that have referenced it by Cohen, um, the title of the paper is, Who's in Charge? So we're still, we're still asking that, that question. <coughs> So we can at least say that the anterior cingulate is part of an executive control network, but probably only part. The truth is, like with all, all of these arguments, usually there's a complex bidirectional relationship, in this case between the anterior cingulate and the prefrontal cortex. And possibly the prefrontal cortex is slightly more, um, it, it is taking part in some sort of filtering exercise, uh, helping to choose the, the correct um, the correct source or providing options for the anterior cingulate to actually do the work of allocating the attention. So uh, what we have really is a two-way complex interaction between the two. So we can't really say who's in charge, but it's something to do with this prefrontal anterior cingulate network. Now, uh, I have to ask you to look at the diagrams in front of you. One of the, there's two reasons why I do this. One is because I think you can actually see them clearer sometimes. The other reason is because this is being streamed, and so I'm limited with what sorts of images that I can put on the screen. And if you are watching this live you, and you're on the course, <laughs> you need to download the notes which are on Blackboard. Otherwise, you won't know what we're talking about. Um, so another way in which you could, uh, another way in which you could decide or, or, or differentiate between different regions in the anterior cingulate is to look at the types of information that are being held. And rather than a phonological or visual spatial, we actually find that the anterior uh, cingulate can be divided in terms of whether the task involves an emotional content or whether it's purely, well, they say cognitive. I'm not quite sure I like the word cognitive, but non-emotional, if you like. So you could just be doing a mathematical problem or you could have been given a moral problem. And the sort of moral problem is, you know, the, the plane's going down and do you save X, Y or Z? you know, uh, who maybe they're older, they've got left, lo less life left to them, but maybe this person's sick, or maybe this person's a prime minister and he's needed. And you, and you start thinking through the moral pros and cons of who should be saved and what you can do about it. They're, they've got a whole set of these really nasty moral problems that get you sweating. And if you're given one of those, and you're trying to work through it and trying to work through the options, it's going to be your... Um, ventral anterior cingulate, the lower part of it, uh, which is the square boxes that are going to be activated. So that what you're looking at here is a picture of the anterior cingulate, it's just the front of the brain, and you can see that the square boxes for emotional tasks are actually quite low down, whereas the circular blobs, which are all the cognitive tasks that they've mapped on there, are all quite dorsal, they're all quite high up. And this is another one of these meta-analyses where they've actually taken thousands of papers, categorized the studies, and found that when you map the, categorize the papers and the findings, they actually map quite neatly into two different types of region. So types of information, what you're doing with the information, that all seems to affect uh, where or which part of the, which region the brain activates. Okay, so we're going to start talking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And this is um, it's quite a controversial area in some respects. So uh, we will have a little bit of discussion later, but let's just talk about some of the, the facts as, as we have them at the moment. The statistics are always <laughs> are always changing on this. So every year I, ha I have to try to search for the most up-to-date statistics. 2007, it was 5.3% of the global population was supposed to have ADHD. 
2010 is the figure I had last year, 9.5% of children in the USA. I think they're just about to bring out a new figure in the United States because the only figure that I could find over the weekend uh, was from 2011. And that's now gone up to 11% of people aged between 4 and 17 in the United States have been diagnosed with ADHD. And of those, I think we can assume around three quarters are receiving medication. Again, the most recent National Survey of Children, 2010, I found 73% uh, diagnosed with ADHD or on medication. So that's how I've produced that statistic. So that, you know, to my mind, I can calculate there's around about 8% of children between 4 and 17 in the United States uh, are on medication for ADHD seems rather high to me and I think you can expect that probably to be higher for for some age groups and I had to update this as well because I started off with a graph as you can see that I'd taken off a paper um, and it went up to 2006 so if, uh, a couple of years ago I updated that and I had to put a blob up here this is the number of prescriptions for ADHD in the UK now so this is a bit closer to home and you can see that just over that time, um, they've really jumped up to that. But I think what's I've really, really has startled me is what's happened in the, in the year since. They have gone up really quite dramatically just over that one year. I don't know what the reasons are behind that, but this is not anymore a linear graph. It is actually going exponentially. So... <clears throat> That is interesting, I think. What is ADHD? Um, three characteristics. It's, first of all, it's very important to emphasize it's, it's behaviorally defined. Whatever definition you come across, it's going to be in terms of behavior. There are three core characteristics. Inattentiveness, which means you're disorganized, forgetful, you don't invest effort. Um, brief and changing activities. So this is all because you're not paying attention to what you're supposed to be paying attention to. Overactivity, but the overactivity depends on context. So you rarely get judgments of overactivity with respect to, um, you know, whether children are playing computer games, for example, because a lot of children who are diagnosed with ADHD are not particularly overactive when they're on the computer game. They're not particularly inattentive either, which is quite interesting. Um, and then there's impulsiveness. And of course, this is the one which is particularly um, disruptive sometimes in the classroom, where you've got a child who would just keep interacting with the teacher and they're unable to put their hand up and, and control themselves. There's that impulse where they have to keep coming out with, the, with their comments and with their uh, response to any questions or taking advantage of any opportunity to, to interact and express themselves. Now, all of these things could be seen as a failure of executive function related to attention. That's, that's not an unreasonable, and you can see that's not an unreasonable assumption to make, really. Um, what sort of problem is it? You know, should we be thinking about it as a biological problem? Uh, we should certainly be thinking about it as, uh, as having some social um, consequences. Because it, if you have a diagnosis of ADHD, uh, it, it, it means you are much more likely to, to suffer poor mental health in adult life. Um, and also, it's also predictive of, of developing a criminal record. Is it a social problem? Well, shared environment appears to play a little part. So, you know, going to a particular school doesn't necessarily mean that you're more likely or less likely to get a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, and there are small differences between rates in different societies, but only when you take into account uh, the criteria that are being used and the processes that are being used to diagnose. So, for example, I think it's true in Thailand. Um, no, sorry, I think it's true in Taiwan, I should say. Taiwan, uh, that the teachers play a large role. Have we got anyone from Taiwan here? So tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that teachers play a significant role in identifying children with ADHD. I think. 
So they actually play a much more significant role in the, in the diagnosis and what we would call statementing of a child um, and officially being told that they've got ADHD than, than in the UK. Um, so there are cultural differences in what is recognised, if you like. But if you take those away, then there are supposed to be less differences in the behaviour of children, you know, in terms of ADHD behaviours. Is it a biological problem? Well, it's got high heritability, which means if your mum and dad have it, then you're more likely to have it. But uh, it's, the, it's the interaction with the environment that comes over as the most effective predictor. So taking into account the genes and the environment together. And the sorts of environment that can uh, contribute to ADHD are obviously those which are more disruptive. Uh, more disrupted. And there is also this uh, interesting example of a, an environmental gene expression loop. So if you've got ADHD, you are going to be influencing the behavior of those around you. And that's most interestingly, or it's most effectively demonstrated um, in the fact that negative parenting by adoptive parents is correlated with the natural parents' antisociality. So if, you're, if you've got a range of children with ADHD um, and they are, they've been adopted, then if, you're, if you judge the parenting behavior in those situations and you say, well, these children have, these parents have, have particularly negative approaches with their children, then you'll find that that negativity in the behavior of the parents is actually correlated with the antisociality of the natural parents of the children. So if the, the children come from parents with higher antisociality, the adopted parents are going to be behaving more negatively with the child, even though they don't know about that background. Well, it's a study. I think if you look at the Frone and Mick reference, then uh, you could probably get more details of that. I hope but I don't know for sure. Yes, it's at the bottom. So I always try whenever possible to put the full reference in the notes on the slide. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's, it's, it's too much to say that the child, you know, has any blame for the way the parenting is, the parent is behaving, <laughs> but, but it does show the complexity of, of these situations, I think. But there are also corresponding alterations in brain structure and corresponding function. Uh, but I've put here they're subtle, non-diagnostic and varying. So in other words, they're so, they're so variable in all the different studies that we would never be able to use a brain scan as a way of diagnosing ADHD. Um, and in fact, you know, there's such great difference between the studies for, for many, many years. It was quite difficult to develop any theory about what was, what was going on. Um, so if you look at your notes, you can see here on figure two, me, I mean, these are the chief areas, but there's a lot of them. We're talking about dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Well, that is working memory, which we, we know is associated with attention. Ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, that is related a lot to um, decision making. We've got parietal cortex, which can be evolved a lot with integrating um, information of different modalities, so multimodal association areas. Uh, we've got the dorsal anterior mid-cingulate cortex, which has again been implicated in decision making, but it's anterior cingulate, which is also to do with you know, executive function in a more general way we've just discussed. Um, we've got the cerebellum, which is a bit of a mystery region of the brain. We used to think it was all just about movement. We're beginning to understand more now that actually it's involved in some very important cognitive processes, for example, involving timing. But, but maybe, maybe that could be involved, you know, if you, if you just always get the timing wrong, um, maybe that interferes with your impulse and allows you to utter things when they're more inappropriate. I don't know. Um, and then of course, uh, We've got the striatum, 
Now, I think we should be particularly interested if we've got differences in the stratum. Uh, you might say, oh, that's just because you're obsessed with the reward system, which is possibly true. But there is also another reason why we should be particularly interested if we've got differences in the striatum. And those people who are at the workshop this morning, well done, well done, um, should be able to answer this question. Why should we be more interested? Actually, everybody should, because I did talk about it in the, in, the, in the lecture as well. Neuroconstructivism. Okay, why should we be particularly interested in a difference in a system rather than a difference in the cortex? Oh, come on. Systems affect the whole brain. Yes, and that gentleman there? Yes, yeah, both these people are right, essentially. That, you know that the, the systems are feeding the brain. I mean, it's bi-directional. I don't want to give you the impression that it's all a one-way traffic. Not at all. They've got very sophisticated bi-directional links with the rest of the brain. But a lot of the information that arrives in the cortex is from those regions, and that plays a very important part during development as well. Which is why, you know, why we people experiment with messing around with the thalamus, for example, to see what happens to the rearrangement of the cortex. To see if to see if there's very fundamental rearrangements that take place. Somebody uttered. Yes. 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 So so for example, when we were we were thinking, oh, how do we know if the Brodmann's areas in the brain um, are innate, if they're just pre-programmed, or if they depend on experience? And to find that out, they took some mice and they they messed around with the thalamus because the thalamus is providing a lot of that well, all of that environmental input, with the possible exception of smell. Um, so you know, very important information gateways to the cortex, and we know the cortex can rewire itself if there's a problem in one region, it's not working. You know, you, you, you have an accident and you knock this bit out and the bits next to it will start trying to undertake some of those functions. So <clears throat> um, plastic is particularly quarter, is particularly plastic. What did I say? <laughs> 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 Sorry, the cortex is particularly plastic and domain general, whereas the systems are like to be a lot more um, sensational in terms of their effects on, on how the brain wires itself. Okay. Um, so, I mean, some of them you know, are particularly interesting, I have to say, um, since we've already talked about the anterior cingulate, and uh, I'm showing you again where it is here, I should mention that Bush uh, undertook a study with the counting stroop, so how many words are there, and you're tempted to say three, aren't you, but, but really, oh yes, there are three, sorry, yeah, how many words, there are three, but you want to say two, that's right, okay. <laughs> This is a demonstration of my failure in executive uh, function. My, <laughs> I'm unable to cope, right? But I'm also under stressor. Um, and what we saw is again on the notes. You can see in Figure Three, and I've I've put a box there to show you the bit that you're supposed to be looking at. Uh, and this is the sort of thing which can really convince people that. Um, Maybe we've got a diagnostic test, you know, for ADHD, because you can see with the normals, they are activating their anterior cingulate quite strongly, and the children with ADHD are not. You know, but actually there could still be underlying systems that are at fault, and, and one of the systems we're going to be looking at is the reward system, and there are actually smaller components in the reward system. And although it sounds very uh, crude, as an issue, it is true that the, the, simply the resolution of the fMRI experiment can sometimes be such that it has difficulty in picking up smaller activations. And anyway, a smaller activation in the reward system uh, may be more significant than a bigger activation in the cortex. Okay, so uh, so that's sort of you know particularly convincing. Maybe it starts tying up with this idea that maybe there's parts of the cortex which are which are different, but they may have been programmed by problems with systems. And more recently, we've also found that there are differences in the activation of the striatum. And this is the ventral striatum, which is the reward system. So, you know, when you want to pay attention to something, no, sorry, when you want something, 
your ventral scrotum activates sex, drugs, rock and roll, and chocolate cake. But I also have to say, because we have now had the reviewers accept the paper, it is also true when you are answering an educational question that you get ventral striatal activation, which I very much like this result because suddenly the reward system is very much involved with your responding during, during an educational task. So we've actually seen this region activate uh, when people are trying to, to carry out um, an educational task. And what we find amongst children with ADHD, oh, I think actually this might have been adults, to be honest. I'm not sure, I can't remember. Adults, it was adults. Adults with ADHD, it seems to underactivate. It doesn't activate so strongly. And maybe that's a surprise to you, because may maybe you thought children with ADHD would actually be fine getting such a reward out of everything, they'd be buzzing around like this. But what happens if it underactivates is that you actually have trouble paying attention to the chocolate cake. And if the reward system is involved when you're answering educational questions, it will also provide difficulty with you orienting your attention towards the educational question or any task that you feel slightly motivated by. Um, you'll also feel a little bit less motivated to pay attention to it. Now remember, this is at a very automatic level. It's not a conscious thing. Okay. It's something you can probably override, but you're gonna have to put more work into it if your ventral striatum is not already going, woo, chocolate cake. Uh, so yes, you know, as the amount of reward increase, we see an increase in ventral striatal activity, but less so for those diagnosed with ADHD. So we're interested in the striatum. Um, and that in, it's an imp, and, and it's an input to the basal ganglia, and, and one of those, uh, in, the important, well, the part that I'm most interested in is the ventral striatum um, nucleus accumbens here, which is right there, and you can see this is where dopamine is brought up from the ventral tegmental area in relation to how much you're desiring something. Uh, now, recent studies have begun to concentrate on three areas of all the ones that we've already talked about. Dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Now remember, that's the part, I think, which is more to do with the cognitive issues. Okay, the, the, low, the ventral uh, anterior cingulate was a bit more on the emotional tasks. The lateral prefrontal cortex, the so lateral meaning uh, here and there, left and right, prefrontal. Um, and that would include dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is a key working memory region, but also the striatum and the reward system. And actually, I've put that picture there. I'm not sure the study by Smith, the pictures are that interesting. I think you need to go to the paper itself where it talks about striatal activity. I realized looking at these that it's not very clear to see the striatal activity on these. Now, one way. Well, another way in which we've also tried to gain insight into ADHD is to look at how the drugs work. And this might sound a little bit backward, but these drugs were being given to children and to adults before we really had an understanding of, of why they or how they worked. And this is often the case in, in psychiatry that you know we, we have a very rough understanding of what a drug does before it's actually um, administered. And then we find out more about it afterwards. And the fact that methylphenidate appears to be effective for ADHD is very interesting for those who are trying to understand ADHD. So it's little wonder uh, that, that we've also used neuroimaging to try to understand that process. And what we think happens is that this, this dopamine signal in the striatum helps orient the attention towards something which is very stimulus specific. Okay, it, it orients you towards a particular stimulus. That signal is quite low in children with ADHD. Remember, this is a theory. Um, and Ritalin, we know, we think operates by removing dopamine transporters that clear up the excess dopamine after the dopamine should have actually acted. So, um, there are little uh, transporters that go around clearing up the excess dopamine after the, the, um, the synapse has operated. And by inhibiting 
those DAT transporters, you end up with more dopamine floating around in, in that region of the brain. And therefore, that can increase the amount of dopamine in relation to a particular stimulus, and it can increase your ability to orient your attention towards the stimulus. That's the way it's supposed to operate. But it's also given us a clue, or it sent us down this road to think, well, maybe this is more evidence for the fact that uh, ADHD is about an underactivation of the, the dopamine system if, if it appears to improve behavior amongst children who have been diagnosed with it. And this is a, a study that shows that, although I have to say, I've had to put this one up on the board because I think if I put it on a piece of paper, you'd never have seen it. But it, it, it's kind of difficult to see. And one of the reasons for that is that the more of a bright spot you get, actually the less dopamine is there. Okay, because um, the messenger, this is about the messenger that was used to indicate the dopamine. Okay, so the, the dimmest one of all, for example, which I think is the is A, uh, right at the top, sorry, it's not A, it's one right at the top. The top image is where you've got a placebo, so no Ritalin, and you've been given a, a, a neutral task, which is a little bit boring, so you're not really paying attention to it anyway. Um, but when you're given... Uh, Actually, sorry, no, I've got this wrong way around. Sorry, that's sort of like, the, that's supposed to be the, the, the one of the brighter ones, and this is supposed to be one of the brighter ones as well, where you've been given a placebo and a mathematical task, so at least you should be paying attention a little bit. And you can see these are quite bright, because you've got that little blob in the middle, which is supposed to mean higher intensity. But the one which is dimmest of all represents the highest amount of dopamine. So it's a bit counterintuitive looking at these. But that's the way it's supposed to operate. Uh, it's probably because it's, it's measuring um, DATs, I imagine. In other words, the transporters. So the, so the fact that there's, uh, you know, there's very few there is because they've been inhibited. I imagine it's, it's reversed in that way. But the fact that there's least apparent activity here means there is most dopamine. And you're getting most dopamine when you've got the methylphenidate and the stimulus. So it's acting in a stimulus-specific way. Whereas if you look at the methylphenidate and the neutral task, that has actually got a little bit more intense. So it's showing that the, it is is acting in a stimulus-specific way. It, it, it's, it's increasing the attention to what is in front of you. And they also asked the people, it was an adult study, they asked the adults who've been diagnosed with ADHD how much more motivating they were finding the the condition. Um, and you can see that, roughly speaking, their response in terms of how motivating they were, were in the task is a, a linear function of how much their dopamine was uh, measured at. So the more dopamine in that part of the brain, the more motivating they appear to be finding the task. And you can increase that, you can increase that dopamine by giving Ritalin, but you need, sorry, methylphenidate, but you need Ritalin is the commercial name for methylphenidate. Um, you need to do that in relation to an actual stimulus in order to see the biggest effect because it's a stimulus-specific increase in, in response. Okay, good. I mean, interestingly, it may not be purely temporary either. Uh, in, hello. Is it just for like a mathematical task? So if they don't find it, Well, I think we can assume it's not. But then if they're playing video games and they are engaged, do they have more dopamine for that? So like ADHD children, they might not find Well, we know the video games will in increase the dopamine. Presumably, if you are taking Ritalin as well, it increase it further, I would imagine. But I don't know. Um, <laughs> actually, there is a paper that might even be able to tell you that, Weinstein, 2010, because he measured it in, no, he measured it in addicts, I'm sorry. No, he measured it in video game addicts. Uh, but the, the amount of dopamine released playing a video game is, is quite similar to the amount that's produced with, with uh, methylphenidate. Um, whether you get a, a doubling if they're doing both, I don't know. Um, 
But interestingly, it may be, I mean, you can probably work these graphs out for yourself, but the important thing is that they're supposed to be showing you is that there is, there is actually a, a long-term effect of Ritalin, which may be positive. So it, it, it's possible, and I can imagine why that might be, because you're, you're in a way you're training your brain a little bit more. You're having the opportunity to train your attention a little bit more. You're having some support in training your attention. So even if you stop taking the Ritalin, uh, there may be some long-term effects that are actually beneficial. But you know other people are worried about long-term effects that are not beneficial. So independent associations of age and, and percentage of patients receiving stimulant medication with more normal grey matter volumes in the right basal ganglia. Um, so there is a reduction in grey matter amongst in that region amongst people with ADHD or diagnosed with ADHD and prolonged medication can actually bring about that more permanent change. Okay, so um, that's where I'm going to take a little break. Um, it's also going to be, for people who are watching on the internet, it's going to be uh, the end of the lecture. Sorry about that. Uh, but we are going to be carrying on because I need to show you some video clips and we need to have a, um, an open discussion about the more controversial issues involved with ADHD before we, we stop. Uh, I don't really want to do that publicly <laughs> in case we get litigated against. So goodbye, everybody.